Morning. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'll ask Patrick's need if he'd word us some prayers, so we'll start with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks for this day. We're thankful that you have provided for us yet again. Pray that you would be with us this morning as we look into your word. We would gain from the wisdom and from the knowledge that you have revealed through the Spirit to us. We may be able to serve our purpose even today, and that is to glorify you as we remember your Son Jesus and what he has done for us. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, so last week we kind of looked at where our culture is, where our society is, and you know, just some basic ideas about how we look at observation, inference, how they can lead us down one path or the other. Um, the thing that I didn't really touch on last week that I really should have is I made it sound like inference was a bad thing and we can't infer anything. But really that's what our faith is. Our faith is inference. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then I skip down to Hebrews 11.3. Uh, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Whatever you believe, you have to make inferences. If we only look at the observable world, we're a nihilist and we believe that nothing matters and that all we see is stuff and it's here and that's what there is. And there's so much more to life, so much more to humanity, so much more to existence than what we can see. We all know that we have a conscience. We all know that we have thoughts and we have a mind that does things. And there is no atom for that. There is no subatomic particle. And yes, science can show the electrical impulses in the brain and it can show the neurons that fire and the synapses. It can go through all that. But it can't explain how consciousness works. And what I want to look at today is why we believe what we believe. First of all, I want us to look at what do you believe? Each one of us in here has a belief, and each one of us in here has a different belief. No one's going to have the exact same thing. If we all did, then we wouldn't be independent thinkers. We want to look at why do you believe what you believe? You know, everything you believe has a reason that it's there. We want to look at why do others believe their beliefs some things that even run contrary to what we believe, and what can we do to reach others who do not believe the same thing as us? I'm calling this part two to the intro. This is kind of a two-week intro before we get into some of the individual topics, but I think these are the important things to set the groundwork for what we're going to be studying. So, I'm going to read a quick little poem. And this poem was actually written, and I don't know who wrote it, but it was in a book that I read many years ago that looked at church history. And it talked about how many different denominations, ideas, and Christianity as a whole has diverged, split, and just has different ideas. So it begins, One day through the primeval wood, a calf walked, bo a calf walked born as good calves should, but made a trail all bent and askew, a crooked trail as all calves do. Since then, three hundred years have fled, and I infer the calf is dead but still be left behind the trail, and thereby bangs my mortal tail. The trail was taken up the next day by a lone dog that passed that way, and then a wise weather bell sheep pursued the trail or, or veil and steep, and drew the flock behind him too, as good bellwethers always do. And from that day or bill and glade, through those old woods a path was made, and many men would in and out, and dogged and turned and bent about, and uttered words of righteous wrath because twas such a crooked path. But still they followed, do not laugh, the first migrations of that calf. And through the winding woods way stalked, because he wobbled as he walked. The forest path became a lane that bent and turned and turned again. This crooked lane became a road where many a poor horse with its load toiled on beneath the burning sun and traveled some three miles in one. And thus a century and a half they trod the footsteps of that calf. The years passed on in swift fleet. The road became a village street. And this before men were aware, the city's crowded thoroughfare. And soon the central street was this of a renowned metropolis. And men two centuries and a half trod the footsteps of that calf. Each day a hundred thousand route followed the zigzags about. 
and o'er the crooked journey went the traffic of a continent. A hundred thousand men were led by one calf near three centuries dead. The follow still his crooked way, and one and lost one hundred years a day. For each, for thus such reverence is lent to well-established precedent. A moral lesson this might teach, were I ordained and called to preach. For men are prone to to go to it blind, although the calf path of the mind, and work away from sun to sun to do what others men have done. They follow in the beaten track, and out and in and forth and back, and still their devious course pursue to keep the path that others do. They keep the path a sacred groove along which all lives they move. But how the wise old wood gods laugh who saw the first primeval calf. Ah, many things this tale might teach, but I am not ordained to preach. And the guy who wrote that was Sam Walter Foss. But it just shows how one idea or one small path by calf many years ago can lead an entire continent to waste a lot of time. And I fear that's what we've done in Christianity as a whole, not in the church, because that's our goal is to maintain the straightest path that we can. But many, many other people who claim to be Christians have deviated from the path and followed one man's ideas many years ago. And when it comes to science, there is no one true path. There is no one idea that they all follow. One of my favorite quotes was Sir Isaac Newton who said, if I have seen further, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. Every scientist that comes along has to have faith. They don't believe it. They think they're looking at fact. But they're taking faith in someone else's research. They're looking at what someone else did before them and building upon that. What if they build upon a false premise? They haven't done that initial research. They're building on someone else's information. And they don't see it as faith. But we do. So what do you believe? Why don't you just take a moment and think, you know, where do you get your beliefs as a whole? Where do you come down on your source information? You didn't think I was going this direction with it, probably. Um, and if I apologize if I didn't put someone's team up there. I tried to think through as many people as I could. And... Um, no, I did not make Auburn bigger on purpose. Um, I've been an Auburn fan my whole life. I'm married to an Alabama grad who's an Alabama fan. Her whole family is. And I will never change my mind. And you can't convince me that anything is better than Auburn when it comes to college football. They, they're going to lose some games, and I'm still going to love them. That's just the way it is. And I'm sure that's the way most of you are with your team. We're going to look at some ways this morning that people build their information and their beliefs and how those beliefs can be constructed and not necessarily out of fact. I know Auburn's not the greatest team ever. In fact, I don't know that there is a greatest team ever because when you look at all the information, there's different decades that different teams dominated. You can look at overall wins and losses. You can look at the number of national championships, but then you've got schools like Auburn that don't claim nine of theirs and teams like Alabama that claim way too many. Um, and it's just subjective, and we know it's subjective. And we can do this exact same thing with religion. We can be born into an ideal, and we can follow it because we build an ethos or an idea around it. So what would it take for you to change your belief? You know, when it comes to football, I don't know what it would take. It would take something like a scandal or for me to lose confidence in the institution and the program. And, you know, if something like that happened, I'd probably just lose interest in college football altogether because... You know, if my team's not there anymore, then I don't have anything to root for. But it's not that same way when it comes to your beliefs about how this universe got here or your beliefs about religion or about any of that. What would it take for you to leave these doors and never come back and to feel okay about that? 
it's kind of a weird thought to think about because we're never really challenged with this idea. We build up and we build up and we try to fortify and strengthen our faith. But sometimes it's really important to challenge it. And so right now I want you to just think, what evidence could be presented to you to say, I don't believe it anymore? And would that be okay? For me, there are limits. And it may sound strange. You may think, well, he's going off the deep end, but there are limits to what I can maintain. If we were to develop a time machine and we were able to run it back for millions and millions of years and go stand on this planet and know that we had been able to do that, then I would have to question a lot of things about the Bible. I wouldn't just flippantly throw it away and say it means nothing to me anymore. I would fight and claw to reconcile it, but... I would have to reevaluate my stance. There are things that we may hold that the Bible says that we need to reevaluate. It's happened throughout history. I mentioned some men last week that I called Christians, and I should have worded them as believers because they believed in a God, but they were not members of the Lord's church. But when it comes to Galileo, when it comes to Copernicus, they were condemned by the Catholic church at the time because their beliefs did not mesh with what the church was teaching. Since then, we have seen Christians throughout time have to rearrange and modify their beliefs. I'm not asking us to throw out every bit of it. I'm not asking us to question everything about it. But I am asking us that sometimes when you are presented with new information, you have to supply an answer for it. And we will be getting into a lot of that as we go forward. And that's what my individual lessons I hope to pursue we'll talk about. But then we look at reasons that people who may not be Christians but may be believers in God, they may profess to be Christians. Think about some of the things they talk about and some of the ways they describe their faith. One thing I've often heard is, I just feel it, or I just feel God's presence, or I just know He's there. You know, I would be lying if I didn't say that I didn't feel God's presence myself. But I can't base my faith on a feeling. I have to base it on something a little bit more substantive because there's a lot of things I feel that may not be right. You know, I felt like Auburn was going to win by a lot more than they did last night, and they didn't. You know, I can feel a lot of things that don't bear out to be true. When we base our things and we base our ideas in faith, on feelings, we're placing it on some, some mighty unfirm ground. So today I want to look at some things called biases and fallacies. So one thing that we and the religious world and the scientific world are constantly doing is basing our ideas on biases and fallacies. The first one I want to look at is the confirmation bias. And this is where we look at information only from our side. And we live in a society now that is inundated with this. If you get on social media, it tracks what you click on. And so what you click on, it gives you more of it. Because if it gives you more of it, you're more likely to stay there and generate money for them. So what happens is you get into this loop of only getting information from your side. And then you feel like you're right because everything on Facebook agrees with me. Even though there's a lot of Facebook that doesn't or a lot of any social media that doesn't, you don't get shown that information because you're not as likely to click on it. Doing research also does this, and I'll admit I'm guilty of it. When I was doing research for my education classes, it's very easy to just start looking for the information that matches what you are trying to research. In fact, it's not even that I was trying to find things to prove mine out, but when you search in a certain way, that's what you find. When I run a search for studies that back up this belief, that's what I get. If I'm looking for um, proof that testing works in this format, and I search for that testing format, the information is going to be on that. And how often do we do this in our faith? Oh, I'm not going to read that. That's by an atheist. 
I'm not going to read that. That's by some secular person. I don't, I don't want them to have, uh, to pollute my mind with lies. At some point, we have to have enough faith and confidence in ourselves to be like the Bereans, to study, to know the things that are so, so that we can actually study things that may not jive with our beliefs and have enough confidence in ourselves to discern the right and the wrong. One of the first books that I ever read to do that was, um, I think it was The Selfish Gene. It was all about, you know, how evolution is true and how everything evolve, you know, through millions of years. And as I'm reading it, you know, there's a lot of people who've been led astray by those books, but I'm just sitting there thinking, it's important that I read through this, but I'm not being swayed by this argument. Um, very often, the information that we put in our heads, we retain, and it becomes embedded in us. I think it's fine to go ahead and do study outside of what you typically would do. I like to read things by evolutionists. I like to read those articles and see where I can learn something from them and where I can see where I don't really agree with them. But it's also very important and very informative to see where their beliefs are. Any thoughts or any comments on anything so far? I, I want this to have some dialogue here. Where do we see this maybe in our own lives that we see this confirmation bias? I think it's in an individual study. Uh, when we're, I'm, I'm guilty of this. When we're reading a particular verse, we pick up a commentary, but that commentary is somebody I have selectively picked out, but I know mm -hmm. he's basically what I believe. And then I just want his thoughts on what I already believe. Uh, I had a good friend tell me a long time ago, there's not many original thinkers anymore in the church. And I think we're fearful sometimes to read something that disagrees with us because we don't know how to handle it. I completely agree. And it scares us. And, and, and to some extent, we do have to be careful with that if we don't know how to handle it. Right. But at the same time, uh, we're not being honest with ourselves if we don't give full investigation uh, of the subject. And we just we Kind of rehearse our creed, and, uh, and that doesn't do us a lot of good either sometimes. Right. I mean, the Bible is, the Bible was not written for theologians. The Bible was not written for the, just the scribes and the Pharisees. It's written for all of us. It's written where we can read it, and we can gain information from it. We don't have to have some ordained person or some theologian or someone who's got multiple degrees in biblical studies or know how to read Aramaic and Greek and Hebrew. We don't have to know all that. You know, as we look through Proverbs, you know, gaining wisdom is so important. And how do you gain wisdom? Well, you learn. And how do you learn? You spend time in information. I'm not a very good reader. Most of the information I compiled in this comes from pod podcasts, audiobooks and videos. I cannot sit down and retain stuff when I read it. Morgan can. I can't. I gave her a stack of books and I said, I need you to read these before I teach this class. And I will see how that goes. Uh, but there should be no excuses in our study. You know, if you, if you feel like you don't get this, talk to somebody. We have an entire congregation of people here who will be glad to help you. You know, this is not something you have to do on your own to do your study and research. It is yours to take the time to learn. But you don't have to go buy a bunch of books or check a bunch of books out at the library. Like I said, Google searches. Now you've got to verify what you're looking at. But that's where wisdom comes in. You know, you have to trust yourself a little bit. Yes? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And that's one of the true values of having a strong eldership and strong leaders in a congregation is when you do study these things, 
and you do have questions, talk to them. Talk to the leaders in the congregation. Talk to the elders. Discuss these things. That's how we learn is through dialogue. You know, if you read and read and read, you're not going to retain a lot. When you talk to someone and you study with them, that's when you will retain a lot more. They tell us all the time in our classes, if you want your students to learn, have them teach their classmates. And how valuable is that for us as Christians to be able to take in information, then discuss it with one another. And by doing that, we can fine-tune what we believe. Yes? Just another comment on it. Uh, is that confirmation bias, my confirmation bias is what Christ says. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm biased to that. You say that's biased because uh, the Lord's Word, the Word of God is all we have, really. Exactly. All these other books and, and secular people's opinions, I mean, honestly and truly, if you want to know or if you want to confirm what you believe, read the Bible. Exactly. And read it, because a lot of people don't. A lot of people would rather read a commentary or rather read something else instead of letting Scripture interpret Scripture. Because if you don't understand something, you keep reading, and there's somewhere else, something else will show up, and it'll explain what he meant before, especially Paul. And I remember when Lois Lee gave us those lessons, he said, he challenged us. He said, read the Bible, the New Testament, once a month for three months straight. That's 10 chapters a day, 26 days each month. It gives you a few days off. If you do that and you read it and you really do, you'd be surprised what you pick up and what you remember and what you retain. So really, if you read the Bible, you've you got plenty to read. Absolutely. And, and when you go through the Bible and you start picking up this quote here, this verse there, this chapter here, you start making a web of interpretation, just what he was saying. We can learn so much. And as you go through and you read the Scripture and you find where this Scripture is tied to this one and where this one references this one, it's amazing how this book that was written over thousands of years by dozens of men works and fits together. And that's the inspiration of God. Yes? Brett just stole my conclusion. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, yes. No, you're fine. Mm. Right. Exactly. And that's and that's exactly right. You know, as we study things, as we go through things in this class, there's going to be a whole lot of things that I say I don't have an answer for, and that's okay. We're not expected to know everything in this life. We don't have to have data and fact on everything. We don't have to observe everything. We can draw inferences, and as long as we round that out and put that faith in the Bible then we're going to be on firm ground with it. So in, in, uh, going along with confirmation bias, I look at 2 Timothy 4, 3, and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away, uh, turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. People are going to hear what they want to hear. When they hear something that pleases them, that's confirmation bias. And it's also the self-serving bias. This is where believing what you want to believe because it's what you want to believe. Man, I want Auburn to be the best team in the world, so they're the best team in the world. You know, how often do we do this? I, you know, I believe this, 
or I believe Scripture says this because it suits me. You know, I feel like we in the church do a very good job of trying to avoid this, whereas other believers may not. I think this is one of the real strengths of the church is that we don't rely on this and we try to let Scripture tell us what to do and not try to tell Scripture what we want it to do. Any thoughts or comments on this? Yes? Okay. Go ahead. If you want, if you get them pulled up. Deuteronomy twenty nine twenty nine. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. There's a conclusion for that. There's a reason for that. That we may do all the works of this law. And then Psalm uh, one eleven. thinking about wisdom. What is wisdom? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. So the fear of the Lord. And then John, when he's talking to Jesus, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. John records here in verse 7. Do not marvel that I said that you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear it sound. So there's the evidence. You can hear it. It's a sense. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. Absolutely. So it is with everyone who is born in the Spirit. So I think, and what Mitch said, I think, like you said, the Bible, the more we read it and study it, when we come to a difficult passage, search the scriptures to see if those words, that phrase is anywhere else in the Bible. Because the older I get, the more impressed I am that God is like a jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. A certain phrase may only appear a few times in the New Testament. But when it does, every time, one of those examples, one of those passages is going to be so clear that he tells you this is what it means. So now you can apply it over here. And so you let Scripture interpret itself. There's a great image that I've seen, and I don't have it in here. I'll try to find it for next week. And it's got all the books of the Bible lined out across. Like a, it looks like a timeline almost. And then it has arcs going from every verse that references another verse. And it is just a rainbow all the way across. Small ones, big ones, reaching from Genesis to Revelation. Just of how many times the Bible confirms itself. And it's just an amazing book. Well, it's inspired by God. It is our blueprint that we can take this book that was written over so many thousands of years and find the agreements and find the confirmation of itself within itself. Um, really, that, that statement right there mm -hmm. is, is why there are 227 different denominations. And, and most of the world does Right. It's so it's so easy to fall into this, and we're all guilty of this all the time without even noticing it. We all believe, you know, it's like I said, I think last week, 80% of drivers think they're in the top half of drivers. I mean, we all think we're better than what we are at anything, you know, and we believe what we want to believe. We fill in the gaps, and we fill in the holes with what we want it to be. Yes, Randy?
it wasn't until I visited, you know, a congregation of the Lord's people, and I heard this preacher say things that to me were offensive, very offensive. And so then, but that motivated me to study. And that's why personal study is so important. If you show up to church and every Sunday, every Wednesday, and listen to all the lessons, I feel like in my life there are entire chapters that I've never even heard addressed. And most of it's going to be genealogies, or most of it's going to be, you know, things that, especially from the Old Testament, that are not as applicable to what a Bible class would be nowadays. But it's so important to have that understanding of the Old Testament to let it interpret the New Testament for us. It's there for our understanding. It's there for our study. And the New Testament is our guide. It is how we are to guide ourselves in life. And if we don't take the time to study that and take the time to be in that Word and go through it and understand it, then where is our faith coming from? You know... I'm only going to get about halfway through this slides uh, show, so we'll have to finish it next week. But I'll just take a moment right here. You know, this is what I want out of this class. We've got to study. We've got to work on this on our own. Anything that you want to be good at takes time. There have been authors that have written in the past few years about the 10,000-hour rule. To be an expert at something, it takes 10,000 hours. Well, that's not a hard and fast rule, but... You know, to really become proficient at something, it takes a lot of time. You know, whatever your occupation is, whatever your profession is, if you've spent, you know, 10 years in it, you've spent 10,000 hours, you're, you're good at what you do. Um, but do we spend that many hours in God's Word? Because we ought to define ourselves as Christian before we define ourselves as our occupation or our job. And I realize life gets busy, and I realize that there's so much going on, but... It's finding that time to study. It's finding that time to go through God's Word, to go through what I'll, what I'll now talk about next week, how we talk to people who don't know God's Word. Because that's where I want us to be able to go with this, is not just build up our own belief, because that's what's very important. That's the first step. But we can't bring others to Christ if we don't know where they're at. And if we only know one side of the story then we can't talk to anyone. It's very difficult for me to go talk to, I don't know, an Oregon football fan. I don't keep up with Pac-12. I don't know their players out there. I can talk some with Alabama fans. I keep up enough with Alabama to know what's going on. And I definitely can talk for hours and hours and hours about Auburn. It's where I spend my time. And it needs to be that way when it comes to our faith. We spend our time in the Bible but then we also spend some time in the ideas and the thoughts of the world so that when we need to talk with other people, we have enough understanding of their side of their beliefs that we can actually have a logical and full conversation with them about here's what I believe and why I believe it. Because if we don't build those relationships with people, we can never do anything with them. You can have the smartest teacher in the world in the classroom, and if they don't make a connection with their students, that student won't learn anything. You can have a teacher that doesn't hardly know the material, but if they can connect with those students, they can get those students to learn as much as anybody can. Any thoughts or comments before we close up here in a moment? Yes. We, I think we sometimes forget that man is a finite individual, a finite thinker. God is omniscient. He knows it all. Um, he, he knows the future, the past, the present. And we look for something that we can say, yes, that's the nail that ties it all together. Well, that nail is a lot broader in that it's the Bible. Mm -hmm. And God's Word does tie it all together. As you mentioned before, the rain moves the lines. Uh, if we would spend time there, we would find that out. But we're too eager sometimes to chase after someone that sounds good to us but doesn't really mean anything. Right. And in a practical sense, when I talk about studying the Bible, here's how I do it. I have an app on my phone. I hit a button and I let it read to me. I can retain so much more by listening than by reading. It's so much easier for me to listen along to the Bible and be able to not focus on how do you pronounce this name? I don't know how to say that name. Just have it read to you and just 
stay focused on the message. Stay focused on what God's Word says. There's so many tools and websites and you know, you can go to and search within uh, Bible Gateway and other websites that allow you, if you don't know the exact verse, you can pull up a quote and search for it. There's just so many tools that we have that we shouldn't be intimidated studying God's Word. All right, thank you.